All right, welcome to the Social Data Science Center Soda Symposium at the University of Maryland. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the Soda website next week. We will have time for questions at the end of the presentations. Please use the Q&A feature down here um, at any time during the symposium to write your questions. And uh, if you would like the opportunity to ask your question live, please make a note and then I will just call on you and you can unmute yourself during the Q&A portion. I'm super thrilled uh, that we have this symposium today um, on a topic that's for those who know me and what I do dear to my heart and uh, even more excited to have uh, Jinja Jin and Charles D. Sogra here uh, to share some of their experiences with us. Ginger is a professor of economics and advanced professor of the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences at the University of Maryland in College Park. In 2015 to 2017, she was on leave at the Federal Trade Commission, serving as the director of the FTC Bureau of Economics. And then from 2019 to 2020, she was on leave at Amazon as Amazon scholar and senior principal economist. And so you can tell that she is very acquainted with these um, different players that uh, are relevant here for our topic. In October of 2014, she co-founded Hazel Analytics, um, an analytics company that promotes the use of open government data. Most of her research focuses on information asymmetries among economic agents and how to provide information to overcome the information problem. Many of her works have been covered by major media outlets. You might have seen her there, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Forbes, Bloomberg, and the like. Following Ginger will be Charles. Um, he had senior positions at Meta and Google. At Meta, he was director of user experience research for Facebook app, and more recently, a research director with Meta's demography and survey science group, who is a strong partner of ours here at the Soda Center um, in the context of the COVID trends and impact survey. Prior to Meta, he built the survey and statistics team for Google's customer experience lab that tracks global advertiser satisfaction for the company. He was also the founding director of the California Health Interview Survey at UCLA and was chief statistician and senior vice president at both FTS RBI and Knowledge Networks GFK. So all names familiar to our fellow survey methodologists here. As member of the American Association for Public Opinion Research, uh, Charles served on the Standards Committee addressing the Professional Code of Ethics regarding surveys and polls in the United States. He also held uh, leadership roles in Applied Public Health Statistics Section of the American Public Health Association and received the National Applied Statistics Award for Achievements in Industry. He is also a member of the Survey Methods Section of the American Statistical Association. So, um, Thrilled to have you both here. Thank you for joining us. And uh, I won't steal any more of your time and hand it over to you, Ginger. And um, Charles, if you just turn off your video and then we'll come back on when it's your turn. Thank you, Dr. Croucher. Thank you so much for including me in this very exciting program called SOTA Symposium. I'm going to share my screen. Let me know if you can see my screen clearly. Okay, let me try to do the slideshow. Can you see my screen in full? Uh, screen on? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, yeah, um, as you know, um, I have been working as an economist for many, many years. I'm really glad to have opportunity to share with you my experience in economic research as well as entrepreneurship. As you will see, the entrepreneurship is very much built upon our academic re research in economics. And uh, we're very proud that uh, we're able to bring research to the market and make real world impact. So let me start the story with um, what happened in 1997. This is a time that I was still a graduate student at UCLA PhD program in economics. At that time, the local news, um, local TV news, CBS2, broadcast a episode called Behind the Kitchen Door. It basically shows how dirty a restaurant kitchen would be, which really um, make a lot of um, 
I guess, um, publicity at that time, citizens in LA County were quite concerned about hygiene condition in um, retail food safety um, units, like individual restaurants or grocery stores. In response to this um, publicity, LA County act very quickly. Just um, two months after in January 1998, LA County decided to issue hygiene grade card. I'm showing a picture here. You can see this grade card shows a letter A if the score is um, between 90 to 100, the grade would be B if the score is between 80 and 89, and the grade will be C if the score is between 70 and 79 and so forth. What's um, really interesting in this seems very um, rapid reaction of government regulation is that the government actually have been doing restaurant hygiene inspection as part of the regulation for very, very long time. In theory, the inspection results actually are available to the public if people bother to ask. However, before this grade card regulation, this information is not that easily accessible, even if it's supposed to be available to the public. So this regulation, in some sense, is a very significant one. In other sense, it's also a very insignificant one in the sense that it just translate a public available information into a format that's easily accessible to consumers. So this grade card is required to display on restaurant door or restaurant window physically. So um, I'm going to show you a few pictures we shot at the time of the regulation. So you can see the grade A was posted here, grade B was posted here, and grade C was posted here in these examples. Because the regulation just highlight the salience of the information, um, it's give us a very interesting academic setting to study how such information is going to affect consumer behavior and firm behavior. So in the publication, um, me and Philip Leslie published in 2003 at the Quarterly Journal of Econ Economics, we show three things. Consumers become more sensitive to hygiene grades after Los Angeles County adopts grade card. In particular, we see the restaurant revenue goes up about 5.7%. If the restaurant has A card, it goes up slightly by 0.7% if the grade card is B, but the revenue goes down 1% if the grade is C. So this is very interesting from economics perspective because before the grade card, even if we observe all the restaurant inspection data from the government database, we couldn't find any correlation between the restaurant revenue and those hygiene inspection outcome before the grade card. However, you can see that after LA County adopts grade card, the reaction is very much intuitive. People like to go to A restaurant, B restaurant might be okay, but they try to avoid C restaurant. And we also show that hygiene score per restaurant has improved significantly after grade cards. This is no, um, this is again not surprising because consumers are responding so quickly to the grade card. It motivates restaurant owners to improve their hygiene scores. We quantitatively show that the score increased three to four points relative to average about 80 points. And we also show the number of foodborne units optimization has reduced significantly after. LA adopt a great card as compared to the rest of California. And this effect is not simply because consumers are sorting into the A restaurant. So this basically confirm our intuition that a very simple information regulation like this can make significant change in the market. Consumers become more sensitive to the information. They're able to identify A restaurant from B and C restaurant. Restaurants are motivated to become a restaurant and the foodborne illness hospitalization has reduced significant, um, significantly indicating that the improvement is real. So all these sounds very good, uh, except that now we see many big cities have post hygiene inspection results online. Some are, versus, some are similar to LA County, 
that they posted results online. They also have grade card. For example, New York City has this grade card ABC, very similar to the law to what Los Angeles County have, have done in late 1990s. We also see, for example, in Maricopa County of Arizona, this is the Phoenix area, the government issue a grade card and the restaurant can choose to post such grade card in their restaurant or not. So instead of mandating the restaurant to post this grade card, this is a voluntary decision in mandatory, uh, I'm sorry, this is a voluntary decision in the Maricopa County. At the same time, the digital database of Mar Maricopa County actually posts all detailed hygiene outcomes, regardless of whether the restaurant choose to post their grade card physically in the restaurant or not. So you can see Maricopa County adopt a somewhat different disclosure scheme as compared to Los Angeles County and New York City. And this is how Seattle area look like. Instead of choosing ABC, they're choosing smiley, fee, smiley face or um, not so smiley face to indicate excellent, good, okay, or need to improve. As another example, if you look at Berkeley in California, by state law, they're supposed to provide inspection outcome to the public. They post it in their restaurant, but you can see the results are very detailed. They're not as salient as grade card, such as ABC in Los Angeles County or in New York City. So in short, we see a movement towards more information, both physically and on digital database on the internet. However, the visibility of such information to consumers vary greatly. And therefore, the impact we have seen in Los Angeles County is not guaranteed to appear in many other places because of such variation in consumer visibility. So um, in light of such information fragmentation, um, I worked with Professor Ben Bitteson and Phil Leslie in 2011 to 2014 under the funding of the Sloan Foundation to try to standardize the information posted by government on um, restaurant food safety inspections. So we construct a national standardized database and try to make this database available to the public. Still, making such a database available to the public does not necessarily mean that every consumer would automatically get on such database and check on their restaurant hygiene condition before they go to a restaurant. How to bring this information to visibility of consumers and to the industry so that they can improve their hygiene condition is still a very um, open question at that moment. So after we finished this um, research, we founded a company called Hazel Analytics in order to bring our academic research to the industry, to um, the consumers, and even to regulators in this area. Because we really want the information to make big impact. Just posting the information online may not achieve that goal because not many people know the small website we just set up and not everybody would know to check this website when they are at the moment of trying to choose a restaurant. To really make a change in the industry, we will have to push the supply side to use such information to improve their hygiene condition and also to push the consumers to be aware of such information when they are choosing between restaurants. So that's kind of the mission of this company we set up in 2014. As of today, we're very proud to have about 16 full-time employees. Most of them are software engineers, but we also have people in customer service, in product management, and so forth. So um, the, as you can see, that's motivated by our research. We know that the information is somewhat fragmented. A lot of house agencies post their information. However, such information does not appear to be the same way in different jurisdictions. So we try to really aggregate those information and standardize that so that it's easy to use for end users. So exactly what we do is we first collect information from the open government website. Actually, a lot of health departments 
in the US, Canada, and UK have already posted their restaurant inspection data online. So our data bots going to collect such information 24 seven. We will try to normalize such information, standardize such information, and reorganize it in the way that's easy to use for um, industries and for consumers. So as of today, um, oh, okay, before we um, talk about the impact of Hazel today, let me go through the history of Hazel a little bit. So when we set up the company, we already have some research as we discussed from the beginning of this talk. And then after we founded the company, we got IP from UCLA and UMD, and then we develop and release um, our software. We added some uh, well-known food service brands at our initial clients. And then in 2017 and 2018, we become Ecolab's global partner. We also launched Hazel Powered SDI program inside Ecolab. And then in 2019 and 2020, we're able to enter the food delivery market. We also partner with Yelp to post the hygiene score information in front of a lot of consumers using Yelp. And in um, the past few years, we have released new products such as corrective action workflow feature, and as well as predictive analytics to enable our industry clients to use our information in order to better improve hygiene condition in their restaurant units. And Yelp has launched Hazel Powered Health Score to mass media um, consumers. So as of um, a few weeks before today, I tried to um, pull out the coverage of Hazel database. You can see that we cover UK, we cover a lot of provinces in Canada, we cover a lot of states, counties, and cities in the US. You see different colors because some of the blue ones are indicating state disclosure from state governments. The red ones are from cities. The, the beige ones are from counties. So this is just an example showing how data from open government turns out to be fragmented because the data coming from local governments. We're able to aggregate all these information into a standardized database so that our final users can find an easy way to use them across jurisdictions. So as of today, Hazel already have over 236 global and national brands using the software produced by Hazel. In together, they cover about 300,000 locations. This would include over half of the top 100 largest chains. And our clients ranges from restaurant chains to convenience stores, to hotels, to nursing home, to food delivery platforms, and to online review platform like Yelp. And our partnership with, Haze, uh, with Yelp has made our house inspection data available in 48 states of the US, which is a significant improvement from what Yelp had before, which was just four states. And we also cover seven Canadian provinces. And you can see the maps here, that's the, um, the states, the provinces in Canada, as well as the 48 states in the United States. And this coverage serves about 80% of US population and 66% of the Canadian population. It covers about 880,000 business pages displayed on Yelp. So with this, um, I want to have a few reflections. It's much easier than, um, it's much easier to think about this as a soft process than really carry out this exercise to the reality. We have learned a lot of lessons in this process. I understand that interdiscipline team is very, very important. Not only just economists, we engage computer scientists, computer engineering, data scientists, user interface design, customer service, product manager, as well as marketing people. And we try to build a business model for long-term sustainability so that we can create a value from open government data for the whole industry, as well as for individual consumers. And 
restaurant has been the industry suffering a lot in the past COVID-19 um, pandemic period. We have seen resilience of restaurants as well as consumers. Our company was also trying to um, write through the macro ups and downs. These are something that we as academic researchers would not have imagined if I didn't dip my feet into the real world like a startup um, such as Hazel. And uh, the last thing I want to mention is it's quite important that we keep on providing innovative products to our clients and to the final users, such as individual consumers. The market demand is somewhat different from academic value. And that's a very big lesson we have learned in Hazel. We hope that's a lesson could be shared with the rest of the audience as well. So that's all what I can say by today. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Hazel, this was just, as I know, <laughs> this was just fantastic. Thank you so much. I, 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 I have a lot of questions and I'm sure the audience does too. Please write them down in the Q&A feature and we'll come back to all questions after uh, Charles um, gave his presentation. So Charles, if you um, turn your video back on and start your slides, then we do the reverse and then bring both of you back on the panel um, after you're done. First of all, can, can you hear me okay? Is that we can hear you, yeah. Okay, that's, that is the important thing. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Perfect. All right, well, let me get started. Hi, everybody, uh, and, and thanks for the opportunity to present this today. Um, I'm gonna try and draw upon, mostly be talking about my experience uh, with both Google and with, with Facebook. Uh, and in the end, I'm gonna give a little bit of um, a pointing to some research opportunities that may, may exist in this area. Um, so let me get started. and jump right into social media. So here's a list of the top 10 social media platforms and they should all be familiar to you. Um, but if you look at the, the, the five here, the major players, Facebook, YouTube, WhatsApp, Instagram, TikTok, um, you can see the three of these, uh, Facebook, WhatsApp, and Instagram are all run by Meta and YouTube uh, is, uh, is owned by Google and TikTok uh, by uh, the Chinese company ByteDance. Um, TikTok has really been the up and coming one. Uh, it has a billion users now, but it is basically chasing Facebook. Uh, it's, a big, it's been a big um, threat to Facebook. Uh, it's extracted and drawn a lot of young adults um, into, onto its platform. And so Facebook has been um, uh, trying to be as innovative as possible um, to add features that will match uh, what makes TikTok so um, uh, attractive to people. One of the things you have to notice here in this, in, the, in this area is just the size of the numbers. They are astronomical. I mean, when you think that Facebook alone has some 2.9 billion uh, users, um, considering the fact that there are 8 billion people on the planet, a lot of them are children and not all of them uh, have internet access. That's an amazing reach uh, for Facebook. In many countries, Facebook is the internet uh, for, for individuals. So those numbers are incredibly important because it's all about scale. Um, for example, if Facebook monthly users donated the equivalent of one penny to you on your birthday, you, you would have $29 million. Uh, and and that's, that's what the scale is all about. So when you hear where advertisers are, are paying fractions of a penny for clicks or swipes and whatever, um, that all adds up with these very large numbers to be an enormous amount of money. I think you saw in the previous slide that, you know, um, Facebook making about 85 or 86 million billion dollars um, in ad revenue. Um, and a lot of that comes from, uh, from advertisers um, that are paying for uh, those kinds of uh, facial impressions. So on any given day, there are about 2 billion daily active users, DAUs, on Facebook. And those daily active users have billions of interactions taking place from clicking and swiping and, and scrolling, everything that happens. Um, on, that, on that platform um, is tracked and it's in large volume. So you could imagine how incredibly difficult it is to, uh, to control this even for safety features only because of the enormous number 
of interactions that are occurring. Let's move on. So if you use Facebook, I, so let me let you know something. You've heard this before, no doubt. You know, Facebook is free, internet's free for people. So if you're not paying for the product, you're the product. And that's, that's a pretty common phrase that we've heard. But since it's free for economists who want to try and figure out what's the worth of this product, um, they have to do kind of the opposite picture. And that is, they say, well, how, much, how much would you be willing to accept to not use the product? And uh, a few years back, not, not too long ago, Alcott and others had done a study uh, with Facebook users. And people said that, well, maybe for $48 uh, a month, I would stop using Facebook. Um, now, personally, I don't believe that number too well. I think maybe people will stay off Facebook for two weeks for that kind of money. But is that the value of Facebook to users? Um, maybe, maybe not. Um, another thing I want to say here is that uh, you are a user of Facebook, for example, but you're not the customer. These companies, Facebook, Google, their customers are advertisers. And their objective is to make their advertisers happy um, and to give them a platform where they can get the attention of users and then they can keep users engaged continually or as much as possible. So let me, let me give you a few research terms here in this field. Um, there's something called user experience researchers. And so these are individual, this, these are researchers that are looking at how users um, uh, use the platform, how happy they are with the platform, what functionalities there are there. And then there's CX, which is customer experience. And this is how advertisers feel about advertising on the platform, using the tools made available to them and how happy they are with that. So those are two terms I'm going to use uh, during this presentation a little bit here. <clears throat> so that's it, I quit Facebook. Well. Give yourself time, and sooner or later. I wonder how many other people have quit. This is what this is what Facebook and these social media platforms depend on. We're very social creatures. We're very curious about what's going on in our network, and the algorithms have been designed in such a way to keep you engaged, to keep you interested, to keep you wanting to know uh, what's going on, either through your news feeds or through your friends. The point I'd like to make today is that these platforms are really places of commerce. Um, on Facebook alone, there are over 200 million businesses. And a lot of these businesses are small businesses um, and don't have brick and mortar stores. Um, and they, they depend on Facebook, Facebook, Instagram, uh, in order to uh, sell their products uh, and make their services available to people. Uh, on Google, there is about 2 million advertisers on Google's advertising platform. And, and and this is, this is just the ones that are on the platform. When you click on an ad and go to another website, you'll notice that you see other advertisers there also, people that are publishing on those websites. So Google gets money for those that are on their platform and even for those publishers to which is secondarily you see get access to. Um, so when asked why he robs banks, Willie Sutton, the bank robbers reportedly said, because that's where the money is. And right now, if, you're, if you have a business, you have um, uh, a way, of the, uh, the, a product to sell, you, you wanna be on these platforms because there's an awful lot of money to be made because just a large volume of individuals that you can put your company in front of. Um, <clears throat> so what's the economic impact of Meta? Well, in, on October 4th, 2021, all Meta products went down for six or seven hours went dark. And so it's estimated that just during that period of time, the company lost $60 million in lost revenue. And that gives you some idea of the volume of money that is being moving around um, on these. And this is just in a six to seven hour period. Um, I could say that probably Facebook is probably making that much money in a day just on Facebook alone. So, these companies and these, the algorithms around these companies and the designs that are put into these platforms are there to keep you um, uh, engaged, to grab your attention. And that's a word that I'll be using uh, you know, more than once here, but to get, get, make your impressions to be able to see the ads that are put on, on these platforms, uh, either in Facebook or in search with Google. 
I'm going to switch a little bit here and say something about these tech companies. These tech companies, you have to understand, are not survey organizations, but they do a lot of surveys. There's a lot of research that involves surveys, but these tech companies are really engineering firms. The engineer is, is the lead person, the most important person in, in these firms. And in fact, the number, when you do headcount for the number of researchers that are working in these areas with these products, those researchers are a fixed proportion to the number of engineers. As the engineers go up, the proportion of researchers go up. As the number of engineers go down, the proportion of researchers goes down. And their databases are, are pretty much set up for, uh, for business purposes and for um, uh, keeping, keeping business and advertisers constantly uh, you know, uh, present on the platform. And so because of that, these databases are not easily set up for sampling purposes. And in many instances, you have variables that'll be across multiple databases and it's a very complex task. So if you wanna construct a sample for any purpose, you basically need to work with the data science team to be able to pull all that together, to be able to construct a sample. And second, these databases are so large that you can never really work with all of them. In many instances at Google, we take a sample of 10 billion. Uh, in order to be able to understand what was going on and to construct that for sampling purposes. Uh, at Facebook, and if you want to work with Facebook, which you can, uh, there's a sizable portion that Facebook uses are just not available to you. Um, that portion is out for constant machine learning purposes in order to refine and perfect the algorithms that the company uses to keep users engaged and to keep advertisers operating. And so those, the cases that you can use are called the ad hoc group. And that balance is available for UX research, uh, for business studies. And, and if you're going to work with uh, Facebook and take a sample, for example, the users, you're gonna be really users from this ad hoc database. Um, a couple of things that happens is that no user is touched more than once every six months. Um, and so if I send you an invitation for a survey and you happen to be on a sample, um, you, whether, you see that, whether you see that invitation or not, a little be displayed, and whether you act on it or not, if I send you that invitation, you are out of the game for six months after that. So that sample, the available sample is constantly changing with the surveys that are going on that you can't access people that have been accessed by other surveys uh, within the past six months. Uh, and as you might imagine, you know, people don't go on these platforms to do surveys. So the response rates are low. Uh, they're in single digits, not unlike general population surveys, but lower. And so you start off with an enormous number of cases. Uh, it's not unusual to have half a million cases, for example, to be pulled into a study um, just to end up with the sample sizes that you need. Um, the global reach also means that you have to do your surveys in multiple languages. Uh, when I was at Google, we had 40 to 60 languages were being used for each of the surveys that we performed. Uh, and also a large number of languages you select uh, when you're working in Facebook. And remember, when you have your scales, some languages read, you know, not all languages are going to be reading left to right, some read right to left. So you have to take a lot into considera consideration in your language translations. <clears throat> uh, I love panels and survey companies have panels. Uh, but mostly I've spent my career looking at probability-based panels and I've pretty much have not been a big fan of non-probability-based panels, but both these companies have non-probability-based panels. Uh, Facebook has something called viewpoints, uh, which consists of Facebook users and some small fraction of non-users. And these are app-based uh, panels. That is, you download an app to access the questionnaires and get the invitations and so on. Those apps primarily work well and can easily get onto Android operating systems. Uh, because of Apple and privacy concerns, you don't get a lot of iOS people, so they're not available to you on these panels uh, when you try and use them. The same thing, and I'm, I wasn't so involved in this, but Google Opinion Rewards, uh, there's a Google pan panel also there. These, you can join these panels. Th these panels exist fundamentally for user experience and product feature testing. Um, there has been some expansion, particularly at Viewpoint, to try and get some population-based studies to make more generalized um, uh, estimates. And, um, uh, and so there are waiting schemes in place to do that. Um, let me move on here. There is a lot of quantitative sentiment tracking going on in both companies. You want to keep your customers and your users happy. 
Um, no, well, I'll just briefly say that, yes, the state of been tracking, they're like Likert scales for Google. They have seven point scales in terms of from extremely satisfied, to extremely dissatisfied. And Facebook tends to use more of the five point Likert scales um, in their quantitative sentiment tracking. But the point that I wanna make here is that qualitative research pretty much dominates in this area. Um, there's a lot of metrics that people use from their administrative data, but in terms of research, the qualitative data, uh, in-depth interviews drive a lot of the product development and the design features for what, what you see. Now, recruiting is, is always a challenge. You, are you getting the right people when you recruit, finding eligible person? The participants are paid. And because of convenience, they're predominantly in English. Um, when these uh, when these qualitative uh, studies are done. Um, speed is essential. So once a, a participant panel is accepted, is gotten, you know, recruited, um, that second rounds, third rounds, which, which I like to do with qualitative studies to confirm um, what I find in the first rounds and explore some things that maybe came up unexpectedly, don't take place. So you, you get a chance to do it. You have to do it right the first time. So there's a lot of high stress on researchers to design these things properly, get the right people in place and to produce those results about whatever we're testing in a particular product. Um, okay. This is my little hat tip to upcoming St. Patrick's Day. Um, that, uh, and so where's the money on social media uh, for individuals that are say not advertisers? Okay, so as a user, um, there, you can find fame and fortune on social media. There are three major categories that I'm familiar with. One is public figures, another one is creators, and a third one is influencers. So with public figures, um, these are individuals who are widely known, active on Facebook. They have broad media, public eye presence, millions of followers. Um, and, and if you want to follow these individuals, they also have subscriptions where you can get closer interaction with them in terms of the dialogues that take place back and forth if you for paid subscriptions. The most interesting group is the second one, which is creators. This is something that Facebook is aggressively pursuing. And this is a spectrum of individuals um, or can be memes or cartoon characters, um, uh, animals, groups like a band, for example. Um, their individual talents and skills, personality, whatever antics they, they, they do, um, they, they are, have followers who you know, want to stay in touch with them and to see what they're doing and to be on top of what's, what's going on. They also have a subscriber base so that you can get closer to them in terms of the dialogue that takes place. And also you can make monetary contributions uh, to these, these creators to tell them how much you appreciate them. Uh, so creators is an interesting category. I'm going to talk about now the third one, which is influences. Think the Kardashians, for example. These are personalities with a following, um, and they, they have impact in terms of they demonstrate, critique, recommend specific areas of products, activities, or trends. Um, they make their income from their follower donations and subscriptions, but they also get money from uh, product endorsements. When they, they endorse a product and like it and mention it, um, those, those products are very happy with them. So, this, these are ways in which you can actually make money uh, on the internet in, if you can fall into one of these categories. Uh, what are the challenges? Well, public figures have many followers. It's an interesting statistic that you may have millions of followers, a lot of these things, but they follow very few people themselves. So they'll have a million followers, but the number of people they follow could be in double digits. Um, they need to have safety moderators to curate the comments and questions that come in. They have a, usually a, a staff that manages their online presence. And they also have to constantly fight off impersonators. The third group, creators, constant pressure to stay new, to keep creating. If you want to keep a business going on the internet as a creator, you have to keep creating. Uh, so the competition can be competition can be fierce with other creators in the same area. Big problem with creators is flame out, being overshadowed by others. And these are serious threats to their success and, and their income, their livelihood. Uh, influencers. Well, you have to always be current and maintain a present. These are individuals that you would do really well if you're an extrovert with energy, personality, and you have to be forever on and forever credible with your followers. I'm gonna switch over here to the advertisers, going from users you know, to advertisers. Um, this is a curated competitive arena. 
uh, some businesses, especially small ones, will do their own ad campaigns on, on the internet, which can be challenges for small businesses. But these platforms like both Facebook and, and Google, they provide a number of tools, software tools to help you. And there's online training, but there, there's no real person to help you. Everything you do has to take place with, um, with the online training programs that they have and the guidelines that they use. Um, there are some relevant analytics programs like Google Analytics, for example, that are made available to help you assess, to assess your success uh, or your failures. Um, and so you can track how well your campaigns are going. But one of the features with advertisers is a competitive um, algorithmic bidding process that takes place. You wonder which, why do you see certain ads? Why do certain ads show up on search and the others don't? Um, how do you get there? And what happens is there's real-time bidding that takes place. And this is instantaneous types of bidding that's going on. And that someone that bid a little bit more in cost per click will show up on the ad and you won't. And if you have to raise your cost per click price, you know, you might appear further down or have in a different location. So there's this competitive bidding process is an important feature in terms of how all these advertisers compete for this very small amount of real estate that exists on these platforms. Um, finally, uh, mid-sized to large businesses, many of them have in-house marketing experts. They really know how to use Google products, Facebook products, um, how to be successful on those platforms or otherwise they outsource their online marketing to professional uh, agencies. Okay, so where are the research opportunities? Very quickly, um, <clears throat> there are a lot of behavioral research opportunities. If you're into personal networks, networking opportunities, this is a defining feature of Facebook, for example, if you, uh, this and other social media platforms. So behavioral research around networking is, 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 is a, a, a research opportunity that exists. The creative journey, which interests me a lot, it's an occupational path for individuals, places of measures of success and failure. There are the psychological consequences that people have to deal with. Um, but anyway, there are multiple levels of creators, which I could talk about if you want me to. Um, and understanding these is, is important. And I think there's a lot of room for research here. Now, the metaverse, if that happens, um, you know, what data collection methods would we use in the metaverse? Who's in the sample when you pick an avatar? Is that the person behind it? Is that the avatar's personality? I mean, the metaverse offers a lot of challenges. And what I've seen so far is people putting what looks like an online survey um, in a 3D metaverse, a virtual uh, uh, artificial reality environment, and just kind of picking things off of with radio buttons with a, with a pointer. Um, so I think there's a lot of room here for how we might do data collection in the metaverse. And the third thing I'm going to talk about is the rev revolution. And I use that word quite literally here is in search. Um, things like uh, what's going on with uh, artificial intelligence, chat, GPT, being AI, Google Assistant. This is really going to change how we use the internet. I mean, think of the old Star Trek you know, things. You say, hey, computer, tell me about this. And the computer talks to you. And this is really what you're going to be seeing in search today. A couple of references. Uh, a book I like that's quick and easy, it's The Hype Machine. Um, if you're going to do research on social media, um, this is not, it, it, even though it was published 2014, it's still valuable. This team at RTI, Social Media, Sociality and Survey Research. And if you want to know about AI, uh, you grab the February issue of The Economist and you can read about chatbots and dialogue for search. Uh, let me just finish up with one thing. I use ChatGPT to do something like we all do. I wanted to know what did it say about me and what I did on California Health Interview Survey? Well, it gave me two great paragraphs uh, that were exactly on the money and very flattering. Uh, but the third paragraph said that I had worked at the, the center at UCLA for over 20 years, which was not true. And then it said I passed away in 2012. So this is probably why I'm not getting any job offers at the moment. But so be careful with these AI programs if you use them. Okay. And that's it, thank you. Thank you, Charles. I think your uh, avatar did a good job in impersonating <laughs> the, the, the previous you. Um, so this is great. If you just unshare, Charles, and then we can have uh, both of you up on the panel. And I do want to start with one uh, question to Ginger. Um, have you, with Hazel, used uh, any of the social media platforms to um, advertise your existence? The the product, what can be done to make people aware of it or you for your academic life? 
Um, I guess the company, um, the answer to that question is yes, from the company's perspective. I myself have not used much of the social media, but the company has used a lot of the social media to um, let people know what um, what products we have for the industry and for consumers, as well as to educate the public about why the hygiene inspection of restaurant is important and um, what exactly was inspected by government officials and how the, um, if you're a restaurant manager, how you can improve your hygiene condition. Thanks. And uh, Charles, I, I asked uh, Ginger that because I thought it was interesting that in your presentation, you didn't, you, you sort of left out the fact that we all are advertisers of sorts. I mean, you know, about our personal life or about our academic life or the side business or what have you. But I, I do think that uh, it feels to me that lines are maybe much more blurry there. Um, but uh, a more serious question, Ginger, you said um, that you learned a lot of lessons in sort of the reward function as an academic versus the reward function of uh, a company and the startup. And I was wondering if you can say a few more words to that and how you manage to balance that. I, I take it the speed in a startup is very different and as you said, the value orientation is very different. How did you struggle that? And how many people does Hazel have that do that with you? <laughs> um, yes, I should be clear that I do not run the company. The company okay. is a professional team. We have professional manager and so forth. Um, however, that being said, I think the academic value of this research, as a researcher, I would say, okay, let's see what kind of data variation we have if we have a sample covering 80%, 90% of people, that sounds great, and let's go ahead. However, from the business perspective, a client may say, okay, I want 100% coverage. If you don't have 100% coverage, we're not gonna use your product. And that is a very different perspective that I would not anticipate as academic researcher. But from client's perspective, I totally understand. And how can you satisfy that demand is a very different business decision as compared yeah. to research. I can see that. Chance, have you seen those kind of uh, trade-off decisions between sort of the the academic and the more uh, business-oriented demands um, to the research or to, yeah, uh, to the things you've been involved in? I mean, you work for companies that serve academic clients uh, also. Sure. Uh, well, uh, yeah, I mean, if you're an academic um, researcher, you can you can actually approach both uh, Google and Facebook uh, for research projects. Um, it certainly helps to um, to know somebody uh, to connect that they have a mutual interest. Um, and but yeah, I think uh, I think I, that there's 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 a um, an active um, relationship with academic researchers um, who use these uh, these platforms. And it's interesting too. Sometimes you want to use the data. You may be working with general population, um, and but you you want to be able to collect data uh, or or uh, reference data that comes from these platforms. And there's there's a way there are ways to do that. Interesting that you brought up uh, the data collection. We saw a question here in the um, Q and A section from Raphael. Um, wondering how the non-users are recruited for Facebook viewpoints. Uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, access panel that Facebook has. Can you shed some light on the non-user parts? Right, I mean, people, people just kind of organically appear uh, from, you know, wanting to participate. Uh, there, are, there are recruitment um, processes, uh, I guess, that exist on the internet. I'm, I'm really not too sure how they get non-users. I to be honest with you, most of the um, most of the things that I've been involved in was trying to get um, users on the platform. But I mean, also by reference, if you're on Facebook and you know viewpoints exist, you could probably tell somebody else that they can get on viewpoints. Um, you know that 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 that's certainly a violation of independence if you're knowing other individuals. But um, yeah, there's a number of ways. But you don't have to be a Facebook user to be on viewpoints. Thanks. Um, Ginger, I, I received people sending questions in all kinds of channels. I received another question here to you, more on the sort of 
hands-on advice side? Like if you as an academic want to start such a, insert your favorite name analytics company in the way that you described it, what, what would you say is the thing that you now know that you wish you had known? Um, that's a good question. I think we did a few things correctly in the past of entrepreneurship. The first is um, the for-profit approach. We actually explored for-profit approach, now-for-profit approach, or even just academic research-centric approach. Eventually, we figure out that um, to make a real impact to the industry, and to consumers, the sort of layback academic research approach or the nonprofit approach probably not sustainable. Mm -hmm. like if we're looking, say, nonprofit, we probably have to keep on writing grant applications, and that may or may not come. Um, it may not be customer driven. It will be like funding, money driven. Um, so I feel that's not sort of put. The customer will put the final user in the center and to try to address their needs. The for-profit approach also forces us to be financial conscious and to um, make sure the product we deliver does have actionable value <laughs> to um, the final user. So, so I think that's that's the first thing we did correctly. The second one is um, it was the company was founded by um, a few professors like me, but we were not intimately involved in operation of the startup. I think having a professional team running it from day one is, is some of the few things that we think we chose um, wisely. Um, I think running things as a business is very different from sort of try to write academic paper or having a large academic project it just your objective function is a little different um, <laughs> sort of the way that you try to understand your um, object function is quite different so so having um, specialized people doing that is um it was quite helpful i'm also very thankful to um the maryland innovation initiative program that's a program help us jump from the start that's they give us a few um seed grant for us to explore the landscape without worrying, for example, the interest on the loan or something mm -hmm, like that. Mm -hmm. Small um, kind of grant rather than um, rather than sort of financial centric business loan. So I think that was very helpful at the very beginning. That's great. Thank you. And Diane Wilma followed up with the question here in the chat, wondering if the things that you learned in practice that differed from economic theory or you know things that you <laughs> might have seen there if any of that has led you to alter uh, your theory or what you teach and if so in which way oh um definitely definitely i think in economic teaching or economic research we often tend to rationalize agents behavior right we sort of economists tend to assume everybody is fully rational and fully conscious of all the information around them and make sort of sophisticated decision after weighing all the benefits and the costs and so forth. Um, but I think in reality, nothing is as clean as that. And maybe in economic research, we can put in some assumption or looking at certain corner of the data to gloss over that um, reality. But when you're dealing with um, real users, I, I think that's very, um, very real. Like, for example, if we put something in front of the client, you thought that should be very useful. They should pay attention to it immediately. They should have used it and see the value of it automatically. All of that is wrong. That's, <laughs> you, you sort of have to make sure, okay, maybe we need to test the um, user interface so that this information does appear clear, salient, and valuable to the user at the first glance of their attention. And that should be followed up with some value that's very easily seen by the clients. You can't count on the clients to do very sophisticated 
benefit cost analysis and realize, oh, this will be useful in their 10 year plan or something, and then they will use it. That's not how every um, client works. Not every user, it could be individual or enterprise uh, works. So it's like, when we design our product, it has to cater to their demand, not they cater to our economic thoughts. Yeah, thank you. That's uh, super interesting. And uh, Charles, it, it ties so much to the research that you did at these big platforms, right? I mean, you said that you worked on uh, on the research side, but certainly the user experience and you know what are people paying attention to and how should that be done. Have you encountered such experiences too? Um, that even big companies like uh, Facebook or Google, they put out uh, product services, think it works great, and then your research or the actual uh, vote on the street or in the internet shows that it didn't work at all. Have you seen that happening too? Well, of course. Yeah, I mean, I have seen that happening. Um, let's just say uh, I, I noticed, some, like I talked earlier about sentiment tracking. Um, we, we do sent, uh, you know, quarterly sentiment tracking at Google for um, advertisers. And those, those metrics are really hard to move. I mean, you know, once you have this mm -hmm. metric here, and, and that's a big challenge. But I have seen where it has moved, and it moved in a negative direction. And even though people kind of don't pay a lot of attention to sentiment tracking once they kind of know how stable it is. But if that moves in a negative direction, it gets attention. Um, Got it. And, you know, and that, that, that's for sure. Um, and also for user experience, a lot of it, um, you know, a lot of it has to do with functionality, how people are operating on the platform and what options you give them. And so there are a lot of tests that are done where some people get to what, see what's usual on the platform and some people are getting what the mm -hmm. new tested version might be and, or, or maybe two or three tests, what might be. Um, and, and so decisions are made, you know, ba based, on, based on those. And um, uh, so that, that's, you know, it's interesting when I say user experience, when I was at, uh, uh, in that program, I mean, I had 34 researchers working for me, something like that, each of them doing two or three product projects. So there's a lot of research that's going on, many of it product specific and down to very small pieces and that individuals will look at. So everything that you see on these platforms um, got there because somebody has tested that particular tiny minute piece, uh, how, it, how it operates relative to other pieces. And did you improve the efficiency? Did you improve engagement? Did people like what they were doing? And, um, mm -hmm. and so, yeah, it's constantly, everything's constantly moving, constantly being tested. One last question here from Jason Fields uh, in the chat. He was wondering when research is done that tries to generalize to the broader population or to the public um, using Facebook or platforms of that like, um, how weighting adjustment is done. I can say, Jason, for our CITES survey, uh, we did this uh, with just broad uh, stroke um, demographic post stratification adjustments. Um, but the primary interest for us wasn't so much trying to extrapolate to the broader public, but to track daily changes. And those were interested even in the unadjusted uh, versions of it. But Charles, you have a much broader view on, on research done and sometimes the attempts to um, speak to the broader public. And so how, what's your experience, how to include um, non-Facebook or non-Google users uh, to make such yeah. uh, claims? Well, a lot, a lot of those studies are done with external panels. So um, you, you work with external samples. So your general population survey is going to, if you were doing a general population survey, just in general, um, and you wanted to pull a population sample, um, researchers will do that of which there will be Facebook users, Google search users in, in that population. So for a general population survey, that's, those are the ones that have, I'd say the most credible um, approach for generalization. If you did just Facebook users, well, I don't have to tell you that, there are biases that we associated with sure. that. And that's, and you know, yes, you can, you can wait it, be my guest. But can you believe the results? You know, that's another story. So yes, so yeah, the general population estimations are generally made, are, are made uh, using external panels. 
Okay. Well, thank you both. We already reached the end of our session here. Uh, thanks to all attendees. And um, please do keep an eye out on future SODA symposia. Uh, the next one um, will be on Tuesday, April 11. And uh, we have um, John Goldbeck, who is from the College of Information Studies, and Jennifer Romano, um, who is uh, a UX researcher, so nicely following up on the discussion that we had today. So thank you all, and um, I look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks in particular to you, Ginger and Charles, for coming. That was terrific. Thank you so Absolutely. much. Absolutely. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you.